What's up my friends, welcome back to another episode of Learn More and today we will talk about FPGAs. And let's go directly into the topic because I usually make some notifications in these kind of videos and we talk about the new stuff about the channel, about the, my website, about the form and so on. But I will leave those for the end of the video. So let's go and talk about uh, FPGAs. And first of all, I would like to tell you that I already have a few tutorials about FPGAs. So if you want to learn how to use these FPGAs, how to program it, how to use Verilog, what are logic gates, Please see the description because I'll leave the tutorial links. We start with uh, what are logic gates, then we'll see how to use Verilog. Then you will see some videos about basic programming in Verilog and or VHDL and how to make a blink code, how to make the synthesis. And finally, we'll make more complicated stuff like a word transmission so you can send and receive data using an FPGA. So if you want to learn how to use those, check the videos below. But now you will ask why I'm making this video about FPGAs. Well, first of all, that's because uh, in the description, in the comments of those videos, I always have comments like that you don't understand really what is an FPGA. You still don't understand that. What, uh, why we use it instead of a microcontroller, what we have inside of the FPGAs, how they work, and if it is better to use an FPGA, uh, FPGA instead of a microcontroller or not, when to use it for what kind of projects and so on. So today I will try to explain the best that I can all that I know about FPGAs and I hope that you will learn even more about this topic. So for that we have these topics here as you can see. First of all we will talk about uh, the, smaller, the smallest part that we have inside of this, micro, this uh, FPGA chip and then we get bigger and bigger, we will set the logic gates, the blocks and so on. So we get from the smallest part to the biggest one. Then we will see how to connect these blocks one to each other and make them, well, make a function. Then we'll see how to program, well, actually it's not program on FPGA, but how to make the synthesis, it is called a synthesis. What is this synthesis inside of an FPGA and how to make it? And uh, then we'll talk about what it, when is better to use an FPGA and when is not. And a small comparison between uh, FPGAs and microcontroller in order to figure out when is better to use it and when is better to, well, just use a microcontroller. Okay, so these are the basic uh, topics that we'll see in this video, so let's get started. Let me just uh, change the picture here. Okay, so as I told you, we'll start with the smallest thing that we have in the side of an FPGA. That could be the material, which is silicon. Usually we use silicon to make these chips, but silicon is just a material. The smallest component that we could have should be a transistor, which is this part here. Probably you don't identify this as a transistor because this is the top view of this transistor. If this is the layout. So this is how we should see this transistor seen from, the, from the, the top of the transistor. As you can see, we have a source, a gate and a drain. The S stands for source, the D for the drain and the G for the gate. So this is a MOSFET transistor, as you can see. And if you want the current flow from the source to the drain, this is a P MOSFET, you will have to activate the gate. This is, this is a FET MOSFET. We will have to open the channel by activating the gate. And in that way, we have a current flow from the source to the drain. So what you could do with this uh, MOSFET, uh, with this transistor? By the way, I'll also leave below some videos about the PN junction, the diode, and then about the PMP transistor, what we have inside the, the, the chemical reaction and the physics inside of a transistor and a diode, in order to learn even more how is the internal structure of a transistor and how to make it work. But anyway, that's not for today. Let's just keep, uh, stay simple and use the transistor. So the smallest thing that we can have is this transistor. What can we do with this uh, component? Well, if you merge together a few transistors, you could, you could make a logic gate. And as we have seen in the tutorial about logic gates, we have the AND gate, the OR, the NOR, the XOR, and so on. So these are logic gates, as you can see, by merging them together, we have a gate here, we have a drain here, a source, we have the output, the input, connected to VDD or connected to ground. And by merging these transistors together, we can make a logic gate, and in a few moments, we'll see the most basic logic gate that we could have. Once we have the logic gates, which by the way, FBJ stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. So we have an array, of, an array of logic gates that we can program by electrical signals. That's why we call this FPGAs. So once we have the logic gate, we can make an entire array of logic gates like, like we have here. With all these blocks, we can create blocks like uh, multiplexers, the ALU, which is the arithmetic logic unit, we could create memory, clock drivers, uh, registers, maxis, which is multiplexers, I already, all, already told you that, and so on. So we pass from the transistor to logic gates, and using logic gates we can make blocks like multiplexer, ALU, uh, clock drivers, and so on. 
And using those blocks, we can merge them together to create our functions, which is what we define in the code, which is what we want. For example, if you want to turn on an LED, to blink an LED, you will create a function in Verilog and that will be will pass to the synthesis and the synthesis will be created in the FPGA using these blocks. So pretty much that's the pass from the smallest part to the biggest one. Now we should see the inverter example in order to show you what we could do with these transistors. I told you that using just a simple transistor you could make a logic gate. The most simple logic gate is the inverter, which is also called NUT, and if you have a ball or a circle at the output of the, of the, the gate, that means that that is inverted. And if you have a bar on top of the function of the logic gate, so if you have AB and the bar on top, that means that is AB negative or, so, or inverted. So let me explain a little bit how you can make the most simple logic gate, which is the NOT gate or the inverter. Here we have two transistors. The top one is a P-channel transistor and this one is connected to VDD or VCC or positive, whatever you want to call it. And the bottom one is an N-channel transistor and this is connected directly to ground. In digital, we consider ground to be a zero, uh, a zero logic signal and VDD or positive or for example for the Arduino microcontroller we use 5 volts. So positive 5 volts will be a 1, a digital 1. So whenever I say a 0 or 1, I refer to a low voltage or a high voltage, a high pulse or a low pulse. So we know that the P MOSFET is always activated with a 0 because in that way we make a difference between the positive and the 0 which is applied to the gate and we activate the transistor. And we also know that the N-channel MOSFET is activated with a 1. So whenever I place a 1 at the gate of the N-channel MOSFET, I activate this MOSFET and whenever I put a zero at the, P, uh, at the P MOSFET, I activate this MOSFET. So look at this diagram here. If I place a zero right now, that means that this uh, N-channel MOSFET is not activated, but the P-channel MOSFET is activated. And as you can see, the P-channel MOSFET is, connect, is connecting the output to VDD, which is positive, which is a one. So in this way, we inverted the input, because at the input we have a zero, and at the output we have a one, using just two transistors. And in the same way, if I place a one at the input, the P-channel MOSFET won't be activated because that is activated with a zero, but the N-channel MOSFET it will be activated. So in this way the output is connected to ground, which represents a zero. That easy we can pass from zero to one or from one to zero. That's how an inverter works. But this is just the most simple uh, logic gate that we could have. We could have more, I even posted a list in that uh, tutorial. We have the AND, we have the NAND, we have the NOR, the, X, the XOR and so on. Here, for example, I have two basic gates, the NAND and the NOR, and if I place an inverter at the output of these gates, this will transform into an AND and an OR, because then we, if we negative, we place a negative output at the negative gate, we make a positive gate, because negative with negative will change the sign to positive. Let me just show you how this works. For example, you know that in an AND gate, when both the inputs are positive, uh, in the NAND gate, when both the inputs are positive, a one, we have a zero output, only when both inputs are uh, one. Because for example, if I place one in the A input and another one and a zero in the B input, that means that the B, uh, this transistor is not activated. So the current could flow through here, but from here to here we won't be able to pass. So that means that the output is still five volts because the output is connected to five volts. If I place a 1 and B and a 0 on A, we still have the same thing, because now this MOSFET is activated, but the top one is not, so the output is still connected to 5 volts because the path to ground is not open. Only when I place both the A and the B to 1, then we activate the output and that will be, will be connected to ground, so the output will be 0. In the same way for the NOR, because in the OR, either one or the other one could activate the gate, so in this way, if I activate this transistor, the output will be connected to ground, and if I activate this one, the output will still be connected to, to, to ground. So either of the inputs could activate the gate. That simple would create an AND or an OR gate. And if I place an inverter at this output, we transform this from NAND to AND and from NOR to OR. I think that this is pretty simple. So as you can see that using just some simple transistors, these are represented by BJT transistors, but inside of the, the chip we could use MOSFETs or any other kind of transistor that you want. Usually they use field, uh, field transistors, FETs. So yes, this is pretty much the, a, basic, a basic logic gate. I think I have here, yes, another photo with some of the most common logic gates. And these are the functions, these are the true table of each logic gate, which, which means depending on the input, what output we will have. As you can see, we have the NOT, with, which, which will have just, just one input and one output. And then we have all the other gates, the AND, the NAND, the OR, NOR, XOR or XNOR. 
and this usually have two or more inputs and one output. For example, in the case of the AND, only when both inputs are one, the output is one, and the NAND is just the opposite. Only when both inputs are one, the output is zero. For the for the OR, uh, either of the output the inputs could activate the output, and so on. So you can read the, this true table here in order to know how each of the uh, logic gate works. So for now, we know that uh, we have the transistor, then we have the logic gate, which could be each of this one or, and a lot more. So what we could do using these logic gates, if we merge together these logic gates, we can make blocks like, for example, a flip-flop. This is uh, one of the most common uh, component that we have inside of an FPGA, the flip-flops. And as you can see, we merge these are an AND, these are some XOR, and no, these are some XNOR because we have the circle at the output. And as you remember, I told you that each time you have a circle at the output, that means that the that gate is inverted. So as you can see, we have the reset, the set button, the set input. So this will work as a flip-flop. So what we could do with the flip-flop? For example, we can make an, a register. This is a shift register. We have one flip-flop here, another one, another one. We can have a bunch of flip-flops in series. We have the serial input. We have a clock, which will be a signal from any clock that we have inside of the FPGA. We have the clear signal. So the data will enter here, then it will be here. In the next clock, it will pass to the other one. In the next clock, it will be to the other one. So this will shift the data input from the serial. So as you can see, by merging transistors, we make logic gates. By merging logic gates, we make components such as a, a flip-flop. And by merging these flip-flops, we can make a register. And we can make any other uh, component, uh, any other module that we want inside of the FPGA. So um, let me just show you another example of what we could do with uh, logic gates. For example, a MUX or multiplexer. As you can see here, we have two not, uh, not uh, table, not uh, logic gates, inverters. And then we have the inputs connected to some ends and all the inputs are connected to some OR gates. So let's say that we have some of these inputs A, B and C and we want only the B input to be connected to the output. Using these uh, other inputs A and B, we can place a 00, a 01, a 10 or a 11 in order to select any of the inputs to be connected to the output. And that's how a MUX work, a multiplexer. So combining registers with MUX with other logic gates, we can make any function that we want. So basically, we pass from the code, which is Verilog or VHDL or, or the code that you want to use. We pass that to the synthesis and we make it in the hardware of the FPGA. And that will make the functions that we want. I don't know, maybe it will be an ALU, 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 ALU. Maybe it will be just a counter, maybe a PWM signal. Anything that you want to make with this Verilog, with this um, logic gates. So I think that with this, I explain you a little bit well, how we can pass from transistor to logic gates and then to any module that we want and merging those modules we can make even more functions then we pass to the next uh, to the next topic which is the internal connection of the fpga so imagine that we have all these uh, logic uh, components inside of our fpga which is a field programmable gate array and that uh, word array is very important because we have a bunch of logic gates but these are not connected one to each other. What we have to do in order to make the code is to make the connections. So this is a basic layout of an FPGA. These are just a few. Imagine that uh, normally an FPGA like this one, which by the way, this is based on the... A lot of you uh, guys think that the FPGA is the entire board. No, the FPGA is just the chip. The board is called a development board or whatever you want to call it. But the FPGA is just the chip. As the same for the microcontroller, the Arduino Uno is not a microcontroller. The, uh, the Arduino Uno is a board that is using the microcontroller, which is the Atmega 328. I made the same mistake when I uh, started with microcontrollers. Anyway, this is based on a Cyclone 4 FPGA and the board is Chinese. I think it's called Storm 4 and I don't have a lot, a lot of information about this board, but I will place a link below. I bought it from eBay for like 35 euros and as you can see, it has a... Uh, lo um, seven segment display it has a video output a ps2 input we have some eprom we have some other memories this works at 15 megahertz 50 uh, 50 megahertz we have a usb input jtag connect jtag connector to program it some push buttons some leds so anything that you need in order to learn that's this this board is very cheap and also very useful if you want to start learning uh very long and start programming in quartos that's the program that i use for uh this fpga Okay, so this is a basic layout. Just imagine that instead of just, just a few squares, we have millions of logic gates. So all we have to do is to connect these together. Let's say that each one is a logic gate 
and these pins here the gray ones are the inputs and outputs which are real pins of the of the chip which are which are these ones here the one on the exterior these are real pins and then from the real pins we have to make connections between these logic gates and maybe to other pins which would be the output so let's say that you have a function a that has this input will do something and then two outputs b or or backwards two inputs and one out output on this pin how do you make the connection between these logic gates well that's why this is called programmable uh, field programmable because using an electrical field we can make the connections as you can see here we have a small zoom of on these connections here which are these these lines but these are not just one or two lines these are a lot of lines and as you can see we can make the connections and this is basically like a memory you say it this uh, if you place a one the connection is made if you place a zero the connection is not made that's just to simplify it so by making the connections we can connect this logic gate here with this one maybe with this one maybe with this one and we create a max and then uh, with uh, or if you have already an fpg that has a, that has a max already implemented inside you can connect this uh, and with this or with this max with this one and by that you create your function and finally you create the last you connect the last one to the output so pretty much the basic idea that I want you to follow in this representation is that by, by using this programmable, as you can see here, programmable uh, interconnections, we can make the connections between our logic uh, gates. So that's pretty much the main idea of this, uh, of this photo, that we have all the blocks in an array form and we have to make connections in order to create our function or our hardware. Okay, so at this moment you should probably, uh, probably already know how we pass from a small transistor from the source or just material source the drain and the gate we make that transistor we place that transistors with other transistors and we make a logic gate which would be a non a not an and an or merging those logic gates we can make the the small blocks like the multi multiplexer like the shift registers the flip-flop and so on then we merge it together and can, we can make our function and make our code work so for example we've passed from a simple code in Verilog if this then that then the other one that we, then we pass it to hardware, implement it in the FPGA and then we can blink an LED for example. So I hope that right now you know how to make the, the from the small part to the biggest part and also how to make the connections between each of the logic gates. So let's go to the next step. The next step is called what is the synthesis? So let me just change the photo here. Oh, the, this, is a, this is the layout representation of an FPGA. But this is in reality is not is something like this. As you can see this, uh, this is a photo of an FPGA from above and if we make a zoom at a nanoscale we could see each component each transistor but as you can see we have some memory we have the ALU we have some SRAM here because we also have some a little bit of memory on the side of the of the chip and then we have the logic gates I'm not even sure if this is from an FPGA but pretty much this is what you would see if you open at nanoscale the FPGA a lot of gates and all the array of the all, all these arrays in this configuration pretty much more or less okay so the next step is what is the synthesis first of all when we make the code in a Verilog or VHDL or any other language that we want when we make the code in C++ and upload it to the uh, to the microcontroller we call that that we program the microcontroller because we make a program and we pre pre program it inside of that microcontroller but uh, for FPGAs it's not like that we make the synthesis as you can see synthesis converts the Verilog HDL code to gate level implementary automatically so uh, implementation gate level implementations automatically that means that we pass from the code which is just letter and instead of make of compiling the code we make the synthesis it's just translating the code into real blocks real physical hardware logic gates so as you can see here i have an example this is the code that i have in my verilog program and i have a function that says if a then the function is equal to c and d but else if b the function is equal to c or d so how we implement that into hardware well using this logic gates so the program instead of making the compilation when it makes the synthesis it will have to think what logic gates do i need in order to make this code so it will select this one as you can see we have an end we have an xor we have a max another xor and finally we have a flip-flop and the function is output uh, the function is the output we have the input c d a and b then we could connect these inputs at any pin and the output or any or at any other pin so pretty much that is the synthesis is passing from the code which is what we want what we want to our our hardware to make and then you pass it to the hardware so we implement that in the fpga 
So pretty much that is the synthesis and now I would like to talk a little bit to see the differences between the microcontroller and the FPGA in order to understand better when you should select one or the other one. So let me just change the photo here. So uh, the first thing that I would like to say is that the, we consider that the microcontroller is based on the software and the FPGA is based, based on the hardware. In order to, for you to understand that, I have some explanation here. As you can see, this is pretty much the blocks that we should have inside of a microcontroller and all the hardware is already existing. So we have all the hardware here. We have the processor, we have the SRAM, we have the EEPROM, we have a timer module, digital modules that are connected to the IO pins. We have a serial interface, for example, I2C, Wart port, SPI, and so on. We also have an analog module if we want to read analog values on ADC. And we also have the interrupt co uh, controller. So all these blocks are inside of the microcontroller and they are already existing. We can change them, we, all we can do is to use those. So as an example, to see how the microcontroller is based on software, let's say that you want to make a code in order to make an LED blink. For example, in that you will need to count seconds because you want to, the LED to blink each second. You have to save the previous state of the LED, you have to switch the outputs to high or low and create delays because you will have a digital write high a delay, another digital write, digital write to low, and another delay. For that, you make the code. For example, let's state as an example the Arduino. You make the code, you click compile, then this will pass the entire code to binary, which are just zeros and ones, and then you program the, the chip. By that, you send this binary code to the RAM of the chip, and it will stay there, and it will activate in a loop. And for that, you use uh, existing hardware that we already have inside of the microcontroller. But for the FPGA, if you want to make the same code, you make the code in Verilog or VHDL and then you create the RTL, RTL viewer, which are all the gates connected together. Then you make the synthesis and in this synthesis, you also make the timing and the area in order to make, a, to make it as efficient as you can make it, to make it smaller. And then you can, uh, this synthesis, you will translate it into hardware inside of the FPGA. So you create new hardware because the FPGA is empty. All it has is logic gates. It doesn't have a processor. It doesn't have a um, signal interface for I2C module, but then you, cre you create it from scratch. You create it from zero. So that's why this is based on hardware and this is on software. Because if you want to change something inside of the microcontroller, you have to change it in the code. If you want to change something inside of the FPGA output, you will have to change the real hardware. You have to change the internal uh, uh, logic gates that we have. I hope that you understand it uh, let's let's just give another example. I don't know. We have I have no. Okay, I have another example. Imagine that you want to make an I square C uh, communication. If you want to make an I square C communication with the what I mean with the microcontroller, then you will use directly the serial interface module that is already created. So you have to change the code in order to make maybe a serial print and a serial read. So with that you can already use this module which is already made. But if you want to make multiple serial communications and the microcontroller only has one port, you can do that. You can do that. You should have, you should make a softer uh, serial communication and define a softer TX and RX pin and then use it. So as you can see, you have to use software in order to change something about that microcontroller. But in case of the very, the, the FPGA, if you want to make a uh, I2C communication, you should define each module separately and create the hardware implemented with logic gates. And if you want one uh, input, you could have one. If you want two, you could have two. If you want all the pins of the, of the FPGA to, should be an I2C communication, you could do that. Because now you, ch you are changing directly the hardware. So for the microcontroller, you have to use what you already have. And in case of the FPGA, you can create it from scratch. You can create your own hardware that you should have inside of the inside of the chip. So by now you should understand how the microcontroller uh, uses software and the FPGA are creating uh, using are creating new hardware. Okay, so um, now we go to the differences of the between the microcontroller and the FPGA, and this should be our last part. And I hope that with this I will leave. Uh, everything explained about uh, the differences between the FPGA and the microcontroller. As I told you before, one is based on software and the other one is based on hardware because the microcontroller already has the hardware made and the FPGA will create new hardware from scratch. Usually we use to program a microcontroller like the AVRs, which is the Atmega 128, is considered an AVR chip from Atmel. We usually use C or C++, etc. to program it. You could also use Java or Python in some cases. 
and to program an FPGA or to make the synthesis we use, use HDL, Verilog or VHDL and these are the languages that you, we use for one and the other. The next uh, difference is that uh, the code for the microcontroller usually will execute in series. So we have instructions one by one. If you ever seen the loop of an Arduino code, you will see that we first execute this line, then the other, then the next one, then the next one. And if you want to execute something in between, you could make an interruption. But the interruption is not executing the, uh, the processes at the same time. It's just pausing this interruption. We go to the other one, we make this one, we come back and resume that and, and, and so on and so on in series. So we can't finish one uh, before we finish the other one. No, we can pass to the other one before we finish the, the previous one. The, so in this way, we lose a lot of time because the loop will go on and on. And if you have a lot of in instructions, that will take a lot of time. But in case of the FPGA, we, are, uh, we can work in parallel. Imagine that you have an FPGA and instead you have a block that will read, uh, I don't know, uh, I2C communication, will re read the data from a module and another module that will create a PLM signal. You don't have to wait for the data from the I2C module to finish because the other module can work at the same time. They share the same clock, this module will do its job and the other one will do its job at the same time. You don't have interruptions, you don't have to make anything in series because all the blocks could work at the same time. You could make maybe 30 blocks and each will create a PDOM signal connected to an output pin and those 30 blocks could work at the same time. So that's great because in this way you spare a lot of time. So as you can see the next difference is that in microcontroller since we are working in series we are limited by time because the time depends on the microcontroller clock. The faster the clock is, the smaller will be the loop of the microcontroller. So you have to make less instructions if you want to make your loop uh, to be to fit in that uh, clock that we have for the microcontroller. <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining well. Anyway, you are you depend uh, on the microcontroller clock. So the more instructions you have, the longer will be the loop. And since you can make this the into the instructions at the same time, you will be limited by time. But in the other case, you are not limited that much by time because usually FPGAs will have a faster clock. But you are limited by space because the more modules you want to make, the more logic gates you will need. Don't worry, usually each FPGAs will have millions of logic gates. But imagine that you want to make a system very complicated that has a lot of modules, it has communications, it has signals, it has inputs, outputs, you had to, to even process video or sound. Well, for that you will need a lot of logic gates and if your FPGA doesn't have that, you will have to buy another one with more logic gates. So in this case you are limited by space because more blocks will need more logic gates. I hope that you understand the difference, limited by time and limited by space. The next difference is that usually the microcontroller uh, doesn't need any external component because as we have seen before the microcontroller usually all already has all the blocks inside if you want a microcontroller with an ADC you could find one if you want a microcontroller that has SPI or I2C or serial wart ports you can find those and also inside of the microcontroller we also have the processor unit we also have the SRAM we have also EEPROM if you want to store some memory uh, so field programmable memory we have the timers, the digital output blocks, and everything is inside of the microcontroller. In case of the FPGA, usually some FPGAs could have these blocks, but usually they don't. So if you have, if you want to have, for example, it needs memory, you have to add some ROM, some RAM, or EEPROM on side of the of the chip. As you can see, this board already has these small chips here. These are memories, so you could connect some pins of uh, these memories and read uh, read that uh, data or those registers from there. So usually FPGAs will not have this memory, so you'll have to add it on the side. So that is a downside of these FPGAs. Okay, and another thing that you could add to this FPGA is some serial ports. For example, if you want to run I2C communication, SPI or WART, for the microcontroller you could already have those ports, but in FPGA you should implement those inside of the code. So the, the microcontroller should already have those programmed. If not, in the FPGA you should create it yourself. So if you want to create any kind of communication, have in mind that you should build those uh, yourself. You, you should also add ADCs or DACs because the FPGA only works with digital. So if I want to read any of the analog value on these pins, I can't. I will have to take a module that reads, AD and reads uh, the analog signal, pass that to digital uh, value, to binary, and connect those bits to these pins and then use, this, uh, use that as a reference for my analog uh, values. 
So also have those in mind. So as you can see here, most development boards already have this. You could see this Storm FPGA that already has this uh, EEPROM memory, this RAM and ROM memory. Will have uh, digital outputs, pins. I, it doesn't have an ADC, but it does has a, it. Uh, it has a buzzer, the JTAG port, a programmer with JTAG uh, connection, and that's the next difference. Which this is not a difference. Actually, this is something that have uh, in common. Both the microcontroller and the FPGA will need a port. Will need a chip to program to make to pass the code to the chip. In this case, for example, the Arduino is using an FTDA programmer. And uh, this, this FPGA here is using a JTAG connection and it uses this blaster, USB blaster to pass the, the, the synthesis inside of the chip. So both uh, chips will need a programmer in order to, to function, in order to upload your code. Let's tell it uh, like that. Finally, another difference is that usually microcontrollers are very cheap and you can buy just one or two for just maybe 50 cents. And usually the FPGAs will be more expensive, but that is just when you buy a few of these. As you can see, this is like $40 maybe, so that's quite expensive. But if you want to buy an Arduino, for example, you could buy those. This is a Chinese board and the Arduino also, the Chinese Arduino will cost you maybe 50 cents. So as you can see, the difference is quite huge. But if you want, uh, that is just for the low value. If you want to make a lot of FPGAs, like millions, for example, if you work, you want to make something, usually FPGAs are used in uh, industrial factories. So when you make something for cars, maybe like a fridge for your kitchen, maybe a microwave oven, TVs, usually if you make millions of uh, those products, you will be better using an FPGA because it will be always the same and you can make the same synthesis inside of the FPGA. So when, we, when you buy a lot of FPGAs for uh, maybe millions or I don't know, tens of millions, the price will go uh, very very low so that is if you want to use it just for a project a homemade project i recommend you to use the, the microcontroller if you want to use it for learning well just buy one but if you want to use it for an industrial project for a product usually you, you use an fpj or maybe even better you use asics which we will see in a few moments what is an asic and finally Usually microcontrollers are easier to use, but the FPGA is a little bit more complicated to understand and to work with. So these are pretty much the main differences that, uh, that we have. And finally, what are those ASICs? Uh, when the synthesis that you want for your FPGA is working, so we make a lot of tests, you have your synthesis here. Let's say that you want to control the algorithm, al algorithm inside of a fridge. So you want to control the temperature, you want to control when to turn it on and off, the pressure and so on. So you make the synthesis, you test it with your prototype and you know that with this FPGA, with this hardware that we have created, with the logic gates that we have made with the synthesis, the system works. Once you know that the system works, you can take that uh, synthesis, you can take those that configuration of array, that configuration of logic gates and send that to a uh, foundry and tell them that you want exactly that configuration make in a in an ASIC, which are some IC that are custom made for you. So once you know that configuration works, you can pass to that to ASIC and they will make a chip especially for your product. So let's say let's say that you want to make uh, millions of fridge fridges. How is the plural? Uh, I don't know. You can you well, you want to make millions of microwave ovens. Once you know that that works, you can make that chip million, a million times and solder that to each of your product. So that are pretty much what A6 uh, is. It's a custom made chip just for you. Once you know that the synthesis that you have tested in an FPJ works. Okay, and finally the final step. I don't know if I have another image here. Yes, it's the thank you. We are almost at the final, uh, at the end of the video. Finally, why you should use an FPJ and not a microcontroller? First of all, usually we have more pins. As you can see, this FPGA, I think it has 100, as you can see, it goes still to 144. A common microcontroller could have maybe 20, 25, even up to 40 pins, but usually uh, an FPGA will have a lot of more pins and not just that, but each pin could work in the same way. For example, the Arduino has uh, six PWM pins and those PWM pins are working with different registers for the frequency and in a project of mine for the ESC I had the problems that I want all the PWM signal to have the same frequency and that is impossible because inside the hardware it's already made and each of those PWM pins are connected to different registers so if you want to have the same frequency you can't.
But in, uh, in case of an FPJ, you can make all the pins to be PWMP signals and they could all have the same frequency, the same width, the same working principle. So that is a lot better if you want to make something uh, custom made. For example, the ESC, it will be a lot easier to make in the FPJ. Probably that should be a project for me to implement the ESC uh, circuit with an FPJ because the width of the poles, the frequency of those pulses that we apply to the MOSFETs could be the same and have the same frequency and a lot more easier to control. And that is one of the reasons that you should use an FPGA. For example, if you have a microcontroller if, and you want to control, let's say, 40 servo motors, you want to make maybe an RC boat or a submarine or a plane, and you need 40 uh, servo motors. Using the, using the Arduino or any microcontroller, you can do that because you only have a limited amount of pins that could be PWM signals. But with FPGAs, very easy, you can make all the pins to be PWM signal. So that's how you, you make your own hardware to adapt to your project. You need an, to control 40 motors with a microcontroller. You should buy two or three microcontrollers. You need to control it with an FPGA. You can make all the pins to be PWM signal. I hope that you understand this, this example. Another difference, uh, which is better for the FPGAs, is that usually you work with FPGAs at a higher frequency. For example, this works at 50 MHz. Microcontrollers would work at 8 MHz, maybe 20, 16. We also have some microcontrollers that work at even higher frequencies, but usually FPGAs could go to 50 mega megahertz, 100 and so on. So with higher frequency, well, you could make more complicated processes. You can even, even uh, oh, the other difference is that we can design exactly the hardware that we need. So we don't have extras, we use exactly the hardware that we need for our project. And that is a plus for uh, if you are designing something, something special, something custom made. And we can also work with higher bit rates. For example, the, uh, the Atmega 228, I think it is a 8-bit uh, microcontroller. And if you want to transfer more bits at the same time, you can't. But with an FPGA, you can transfer all the bits that you want at the same time, as we have seen before. We can work in parallel. So with that, with this speed and this amount of bits, you can work with more complicated processes, like for example, to control video. As you can see, this uh, Stormboard has some F uh, VGA outputs, and we can connect this to a display and create all the frames that we want to show the, the, on the display and with that we can work with, uh, with video. For example, the running uh, machines in the gyms are usually made with an FPGA and they have a small display and you can represent video on that. Also, if you remember those old retro games that you have to go into a, into a, a room, a special gaming room that is made uh, only for these games, they have a screen and inside they usually had an FPGA that only uh, will only represent that uh, video game. They will create each frame of the game and with that you can you have some controls, left or right or jump or maybe a motorcycle. Any kind of those old games usually were made with FPGAs and they have the game inside and they can represent video and sound. Because having more bit rates and more frequency we could also uh, work with sound and we also have more memories for the FPGAs. So higher frequency, you could work with video, with audio and also more memory and you can have exactly the, the hardware that you want. Finally, for the bad stuff, the FPGAs can be more expensive but, for, uh, but it could get better if you get high volume. So if you buy more, you could get lower the price a lot, even more than microcontrollers. And uh, then uh, another good thing is that for FPGAs, once the code works, you can pass to ASICs and get the price even lower because that ASIC, that chip is specially made for you. So if you buy millions of those, the price will get very, very low, maybe even a few cents. And the last one is that uh, the bad stuff about FPGAs is that you need external components. You need an ADC, you need memory and all the peripherals, uh, peripherals all the parts, the components that you have to add uh, aside of the FPGA. And uh, for what I recommend you to use this, if you have a homemade project, use the microcontroller because it's easier to use, it's cheaper, it's faster, you have all the ports already made. But if you want to make an industrial project, you should uh, at least think to implement that in an FPGA because if your project will get bigger, you have a sponsor, you will have to make a lot of products, it is better to have it directly made in an FPGA and maybe pass that to an ASIC and, that, and by that you can get your product to market. So these were all the, the differences. I hope that I explain you how we pass from transistor to logic gate to all the modules, what we have inside of the FPGA, how we make the synthesis, how we pass from code to the real uh, stuff, to real uh, hardware and then activate the outputs. If you want to learn more about FPGAs, please see the links below. I think we have four or five tutorials. 
you will learn how to use Verilog, you will learn what are logic gates and how to, to read the true tables, how to make functions with those logic gates and so on. And finally, how to control a LED, how to control inputs with push buttons, how to make a sheet register, I think I have one, and how to make the communication, the wired communication for RX and TX communication. And you will see that I use a smartphone with Bluetooth connection. I send the data with using a wired connection. I read that data and I represent that in this, uh, this LEDs here in a bi binary mode. So see the links below and also I recommend you to watch the diode video in order to understand why, what we have inside of a BJT transistor or a diode and how is the connection between the P and the N part of the transistor. So here ends this video about FPGAs and now I have the notifications if you are here, are still here. Uh, I told you at the beginning of the video that I will tell you a few things about my channel or my forum. First of all, I would like to tell you that uh, I've already selected the winner of the Patreon giveaway for the oscilloscope, the Keysight oscilloscope, uh, the 1000 series. And he is, he or she, I can remember, I think it's he, I don't know, he's called Old Herbinger. And this is a strange name for me, so I can't know if it's uh, he or she. But anyway, congratulations. I've already got in contact with you and uh, once you give me your address, I will give that address to Keysight and they will send you the oscilloscope and I ho hope you will give it a good use and make a lot of good projects. And the second thing that I would like to say to you, to say you it, I, I will try to make a lot more giveaways in the future for my patrons in order to give my thanks to you because uh, your support means a lot to me, especially now when we don't have sponsor because of the coronavirus. The sales from PCBs or components are a lot lower, so your support will help this channel keep going with uh, these videos. So thank you very much. I would like to take this chance and give you a huge thank you to my patrons and that I will make a, a lot more giveaways on Patreon and you don't have to do anything. Only if you're a patron of mine, you'll be already uh, automatically inside of that giveaway. A very important an announcement that I want to make is about the forum. I have uh, maybe 50, 40, 60 messages each day on Instagram, on Facebook, on even mail and I can't answer all those questions. And I always told, tell you that please, I've been working more than one year to make that form, that website, just use it. If you have any question about projects, about my channel, about anything on, related with Electronoops, just leave it, post it on the forum because in that way if I answer it, other person could see the answer and maybe they have the same problem and in that way you can help the community. I won't answer any Facebook message anymore because I don't have time. And at least the, the least thing that you could do is at least to use the forum. So place your question there. I will promise you that I will uh, save one day at each week to look at the uh, questions on the forum and if I know the answer, I will answer it. If I don't know it, well, maybe other, other person could do it. But at least in that way, you will get your, ans get your answer and the community will be helped because they can see the same uh, result if they have the same problem. So please use the forum on electronoops.io slash forum. And uh, if you want another, uh, another announcement, please use the electronoops.io website if you want to post your own tutorial. Because in that way, other people could see your work, I could see your work and you can help the community or even maybe get a job because the website has messages. You can send a message between the users, you can like this project, you can share it and stuff like that. And uh, the last part I would like to show you is the project that I will post, I will be posting maybe next week and is the version 5 of the brushed DC motor drone. I know that a lot of you guys ask me for this drone and if you stay till the end of the video, you can see it. I will maybe even when I edit this video, I'll put some results. This drone flies very well. I've even designed the RC controller. As you can see, they are both based on the Unref 24 radio module. We have the IMU, IMU module. The, the motors are brushed motors, very small DC brush motors. We have the MOSFETs to control the the power applied to each motor and so on. And as you can see, this, this is already on top of a PCB that has a cool design. We have a buzzer, we have the bat battery on uh, below, we have some LEDs when we turn this on. I don't know if I have the battery charged. Yes, as you can see, we have the LEDs. And yeah, stay tuned for this. I think I will be the video will be ready next week and I will post that on my YouTube channel. So if you want to see how to make this, I'm sharing the schematic and the code. Stay tuned for that. This is the end of the, this video. I hope that I explain myself very well. Sorry, I make a lot of uh, error or spelling errors and a lot of uh because, as you all know, English is not my main main language. Oh, let me. 
I wanted to place the final photo. Give you a huge thank you for supporting my channel, for supporting me on Patreon and using electrodes.com website. So thank you very much and see you in the next video. Keep up you guys.